traffic. More than just an app. Talk, 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 talking Gospel 94.5 and 1700 WEUP. Welcome back to We Up Talk, Dave and Steve. Uh, I am very honored to have uh, on the phone with us Monica Williams Hudgens. Uh, she is, as I have been saying, she is the granddaughter of Strom Thurmond, uh, former U.S. Senator, and famously or infamously uh, a Dixiecrat who was a pro segregationist. Uh, but unbeknownst to the state of Car- South Carolina and and those uh, around him, uh, he had a black daughter. And uh, that black woman, uh, S.C. May uh, Williams, is the mother of, uh, of uh, Monica. Monica, thanks for joining us today on We Up Talk. Monica, are you there? Good evening, Dave. Hey, thanks for joining us today on We Up Talk. My pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, first of all, even though I've done this privately, I'll just uh, publicly say uh, uh, that you have our condolences on the recent passing of your mom. How are you and the family doing? Thank you. Uh, We're learning to adjust to our new normal. Um, It's very hard when you have such a great woman that was the patriarch and basically the glue that held us all together single-handedly. Um, but we're, we're coming around. We're coming around. Well, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. So, uh, let's, let's get into, uh, the, this, uh, very complicated, but fascinating legacy that you have. Um, when did you first learn that Strom Thurmond was your grandfather? Well, I was about, um, 14 years old. Um, I had actually met him when I was he came to Los Angeles and spoke at a church, and so um, my siblings and I met him, but we had I had no idea who he was. I found out my older brothers did, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. My mother actually told me um, that he was my grandfather. We had a situation going on where I was a, a little radical during the 70s, Mm -hmm. and using a lot of the um, radical political statements. And my mother decided to sit me down because of the things I was saying and say, well, your grandfather is a white man. (laughs) (laughs) Surprise! (laughs) (laughs) And at quite shaken. Yeah, I was going to say, at 14, that that must have been... uh, a real challenge for you. You just said you were quite shaken. How, what did you do with that information? Um, it was kind of difficult to digest. Um, I had shared the story that um, I had just found out when I was about five years old that I was what they termed back then, I was colored. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anybody really had a particular color, so I adapted to that very quickly, and then here I am some years down the line now being told, okay, well, your grandfather is a white man. So it was a lot to digest. It actually kind of shook my political views up, and I wasn't quite sure how to digest that information. So it was a little difficult and rocky. Now, your, your grandfather wasn't just any white man. Your grandfather was Strom Thurmond, the infamous Dixiecrat and former segregationist. Uh, you know, he was he was a hard liner back in his day. Um, when you when did you come to understand that he was that guy? That would be about three years later, when I turned seventeen. Um, as a fourteen year old, I wasn't tuned in to the regular um, television stations or radio stations wasn't really interested in, back then, as we said, white politics. So I really didn't know the statements he had made um, regarding people of color until I saw a documentary on PBS. I was really bored at that point, and I heard him use the N-word, and I couldn't really compare him to the gentleman I had been talking to on the phone with the person that stood in front of me in front of the television uh, in black and white and began to say these um, racist statements. I, I, it was hard to get the two together. 
Mm-hmm. The one I met, the one that I talked to on the telephone with this southern accent <laughs> and who my mother spoke of mm-hmm. was like two different people. Mm-hmm. Um, did you I ever, did heard. you ever, uh, did you ever, Monica, did you ever try to confront your grandfather or if not confront him, at least open a discussion with him about, you know, who you saw him to be as a grandfather versus who he was as a, as a politician and a segregationist? No, um, just because of my mother's presence and her strength, we usually ran things past her, our views. And I basically expressed to her how I felt, and then she would express to him. And she actually began to ask him questions in the 70s and in the 80s that she never asked years before, which was, why do you say those? Why did you say those things? And if you did say them, why don't you apologize to African Americans as a whole? Mm-hmm. And his answer to her was, well, it's just politics, as you may. Mm. Just politics. Just politics. Hmm. And that's as, I'm sorry. That's okay. And that's as far as he ever went with it? He never went any further with it than it's just politics? That it was just politics. A hmm. thing that politicians do. Um, my mother actually mentioned in her book um, for gathering votes, um, being here in the state of South Carolina was a popular position, power position. That's why it was as if there were two different personalities um, that existed. (laughs) Wow. Wow. This is We Up Talk, Dave and Steve. Uh, We have on the phone with us Monica Williams-Hudgens. She is the uh, one of the uh, two black granddaughters that uh, Strom Thurmond has. And and you also have a brother, right? You have a brother? Yes. um, Dr. Ronald Williams, he lives in the state of Washington. Mm Mm-hmm. So... So there are altogether there are three grandchildren, black grandchildren. There were four of us. Um, we lost our older brother back October eighth, two thousand twelve, and he was the the elder. He actually knew Strom Thurmond and had talked to him, mm-hmm. but he never discussed with us what their conversations were about. Mm. And uh, the brother underneath him. Well, he was the second oldest. Strom Thurmond helped him get into medical medical school. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and so, this, and this is why I say, Monica, that your legacy, your family legacy, is complicated because, you know, let's go back even further. You were telling me a couple of weekends ago, a few weekends ago, that your uh, that your grandfather essentially started created a law school at South Carolina State University so that your father could get a law degree, right? Exactly. That was upon a confrontation from my mother that he had a, he really encouraged her to come down here. She was going to school in New York City, nursing school. He encouraged her to come here to South Carolina and go to state. And my her husband, my father, was going to law school, and the only school here was USC for him to do the law degree, and he was not allowed to go there. So somehow, Strom Thurmond uh, got $2 million together and as a donation to state and started the first law school there, which it isn't open any longer. But my father was one of two graduates out of that first class. Mm-hmm. Um, it's amazing that he was able to move mountains to do that. But my mother was bothered that her husband could not go to um, the regular USC mm-hmm. for law school. Mm-hmm. So I guess, you know, as, as, as I hear this again, you know, I, I continue to confront personally the challenge of what do you do with this man, Strom Thurmond? And I imagine it's much, much more challenging for you than it would be for me or my co-host Steve or some of the others who are listening because, um, you know, he's your grandfather. But what, what do you do with that? How do you reconcile the racist, the segregationist with the loving, the clearly loving, supportive grandfather that and father that he was to your mother. I would like to say dual personality. <laughs> mm. It's more or less in, in, in um, joking, 
But my mother really was the one that could reconcile things very well. And that is because my mother was a truly spiritual woman who truly believed in forgiveness. And I took that persona on from her as that I didn't become a Christian until much later on in, in life. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be forgiven for many of the um, radical political statements that I made that were not so nice. I would be the opposite of the Strom Thurmond on the side of the Black Power Movement. Mm-hmm. Well, I changed as I got older, and I became enlightened by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and so I know I don't want my feet held to the fire for the things I said back then in my early teens um, or even in my later teens. But as a adult and learning um, that hate is just wrong, and that's what my mother taught us, any type of hatred and holding on to anything negative doesn't do anything for anyone. Mm. And for us to call ourselves godly people, God forgives. And I want to be forgiven is more or less how I began as an uh, older adult to reconcile his differences. Mm-hmm. Did I like what he did? No. Did I like being a closet grandchild, as they called it? No. Mm-hmm. But he did give my mother a living inheritance, and she passed that on to us. And the fact that her character turned out the way it did, things went very well. Yeah. So in the goodness, I can reconcile it, but okay. not okay. in the earthly way. I couldn't if it wasn't for the forgiveness. Right, right. When is the when's when's the last time you saw your grandfather? Um, sometime in the nineties. Um, well, actually, no. It was it was early nineties on a trip to um, Washington D.C. Okay, and uh, it was. I guess I'm assuming it was a fairly typical cordial exchange between the two of you. It's very, very. It's just, it was just, dear Senator. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was more of uh, as if I met President Obama. It was just the distance. Just I was just another human being, basically. Mm-hmm. There was nothing personal about it, and it, those personal exchanges that we hear so much about, just like they have found twelve more letters at Clemson University, personal letters between one he wrote to my brother who ended up in medical school and my mother. But he never approached my sister or I in that way. He was just very respectful senator. Hmm. And and why do you think that is? It was a distance. Um, you could, I remember the, a prideful look but, and I'm going to look at that little Southern propriety here also, because we really didn't know each other. Um, I mean, that's just my guessing. Because remember, my mother is the woman that kept the secret all of her life until 2003. Mm-hmm. She did that very well. I learned new things reading her book. Mm-hmm. I was amazed. My mother could keep things very well. And so I really don't know mm-hmm. why it is that he could be so much, you know, more personable with her, but with the, her children, it was more of a dispoliteness, so to speak, with no relationship. Okay, okay. Uh, you, you, you talked about the secret um, that your mom kept. Let's talk uh, for a bit about your understanding of the Thurman family's reaction to the public uh, revelation of the, of the existence of your mom and, 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 and you and your siblings. Uh, what, what's your understanding of how they reacted, the Thurman family? Did they, in other words, have they accepted you? Uh, have they kept you at a distance? What, what's, what's the state of that? Well, um, when it started out in 2003, there were two generations still living, um, which would be Strom Thurmond's sister and cousin. And then there were his children um, by his second wife. And they made one public statement together. They came united and said, we accept what Miss 
as the name Washington Williams is saying, there was no blood test involved, anything. They just looked at her. Mm-hmm. But the first, the generation of the older people said, oh, yeah, we knew that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So they knew. Um, it's uh, Paul Thurman and several of their family relatives came to my mother's funeral services. So this is the first time of the meeting of, of, of several family members showing up. But there were a couple of family members that stayed in touch with my mother. They met her when she came out, um, when she came to South Carolina in her first public statement. And one of them stayed by her side to the end. Mm-hmm. That would be her, his niece. Wow. So her cousin, um, who now we've been becoming friendly with since 2006. I like to describe it as more of a wall where they have this loss going, and we have expressed certain things to them respectfully, and they have um, said certain things to us. So I think we just want peace, and it seems like the willingness was coming. Mm -hmm. And also Paul um, had even visited my mom. And then I didn't find out about that until um, just about a week ago. I mm. found that out from my sister. Mm-hmm. So it's been a slow, progressive um, healing because they truly did not know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. about my mom. It was the older generation that knew about my mom, and they never told um, the, the children. Right, right. So everyone seems very open. Um, for my family right now, immediately, there's only three of us left because our dad died in 1964. Mm-hmm. And then our brother, oldest brother, died last year. There are only three of us left. Right. So we are open to family. Right. And, right. Um, yes, <laughs> we're very right. open to family, and they seem to be very open too. Sure, sure. This is We Up Talk. Dave and Steve here on Talk and Gospel 94.5 FM. We've got on the phone with us Monica Williams Hudgens. She is the she is one of uh, Strom Thurmond's uh, three living black grandchildren, uh, and we're talking with her about uh, this very complicated but fascinating legacy mm-hmm. that she has. And there's uh, no denying uh, your mom and her dad because yeah, they, 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 all you have to do is see a picture of them. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. His face is imprinted on her face. Yes. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Mm-hmm. Now let's talk about the. Um, let's talk about the. I don't know if I should call it a liaison, a relationship, uh, or that that triggered all of this. Uh, this was um, uh, the. Uh, you know, your grandfather and your grandmother uh, coming together. How how would you uh, tell us what you know about that? You know, how, you know, the, the what you know about their relationship? Well, I'm going to speak as my mother's daughter first because there's a couple of different stories, okay. in, in my opinion. Um, and the two stories, um, the accounts were a little bit different but that they had become very friendly. She cooked. She was the cook. There were, see, there were two sisters from her family, and then someone recently said there were three who worked in the house. One did the house cleaning. I'm not sure what the other one did, mm-hmm. but because there were four sisters, four butler sisters. And my grandmother was the cook, and she cooked very well. And I was told oftentimes Tom Thurman would come into the kitchen where they ate and sit with them and talk. This had gone on for years. And um, that's how they became very friendly. Now, my account is, and I've been an advocate for women and children for a number of years, is that, and classism, is that it was wrong at all levels for them to come together uh, because of age, because of race, and because of class. Mm-hmm. Um because it was you he uh, here in South Carolina, he could have been hung mm. for having relations with a black woman mm. at that point. Mm. Now I don't know if that was a law in the book, but that's what they did. 
and they could do. Mm-hmm. And he was warned about that. Mm-hmm. That's the way it was told to me. He had been warned. Mm-hmm. And the fact that she had an offspring just made complicated things more. Right, right. And so my um, my grandmother went back home to Aiken. That's why my mother was born in Aiken and not Edgefield. Mm. And that's where she was born. Um, because they had to, um, that, that's a very serious offense. So he, he could have been hung, but, your, but your, uh, your grandmother's life was also in danger. Right? Say that again. Her life I, was. I said uh, he could have been hung, but your grandmother's life was also in danger, right? I, I, um, I'm not sure. It's funny. No one's ever actually spoke of that. What happened to the female, hmm. or um, what happened to the one that that was black? I just know that I, I, the way it was told to me, I guess that would work both ways. I guess both of them could have been hung. Hmm. Even though she was, uh, I was also told that she was at the age of consent, because if you read the book, it says right in there, I'm 14. So I say to my mother, and she remembered it, Mom, isn't that right, at 14? Mm. I knew that at 14. I mm. knew if a man 23 were to approach me, that would be that statutory right. Mm-hmm. And so my mother said, well, that's not quite the way it happened, and that on the books, in 1924, the consenting age of marriage was 14, mm. without anyone signing. Mm-hmm. And, and then my next question was, well, what about the classism? <laughs> so. yeah. And, and here, here, here's what I know as far as, I, I'm a history buff, and here's, here's what I know about slavery in that area during uh, the earlier, uh, during the 1800s, if a landowner or a slave owner held and had relations with a slave he could lose his property be hung and his his property meaning his slaves could be sold at auction oh well i had heard that one yeah well there was a lot of procreation going on then but yeah. slave holders <laughs> said in that case because <laughs> <laughs> no one was following that rule. No. It's, um, and I don't know if it also had to do with the relationship. Um, you just treat it, you know, as uh, um, like property because it's property. It's just a transaction. Right. Um, I'm just making more plays. I don't know how they justified that because I, I hadn't heard that before, but you just shared. I thought it was a common practice that they just produce more. Um, to, to be sold off the auction or to continue to work for the slave master. Right, as long as, as, as long as they didn't yeah. have a personal relationship. Well, do you think, following up on Steve's uh, Steve's comment, do you think that your grandfather loved your grandmother? This, is a, there were two stories told. <laughs> that um, there was a casual relationship that happened. It happened one time. And when research was being done for the book, that there were some people still alive that actually told that he could, he saw my mother after she was born several times. Mm. That there was an undertaker. And at the funeral home, that Carrie Butler would bring my mother just before she was six months old, mm-hmm. and he would come and meet. So oh, wow. that's what they were told. Now the gentleman has passed away now since two thousand uh, after two thousand three. So this was part of the information, and then uh, a few more things came up about some type of relationship. But uh, the jury's still out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know um, about that, you know, because people have passed on now. But I don't, still for me personally, I don't know how a 23-year-old and a a 15 or 16-year-old, how much of a relationship um, does that make? Especially when you're dirt poor and you're not educated. I don't know how that works exactly. I just have to be honest. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. I can tell you that. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. 
Hey, Monica, we're going to take a commercial break, and then when we come back, we will uh, we will conclude our conversation with you. So just hang on, okay? Thank you. All right. This is uh, this is We Up Talk on uh, AM 1700, Talk and Gospel 94.5 FM, streaming on WEUPAM.com. Talking Gospel 94.5 and 1700 WEUP. Welcome back to We Up Talk. Dave and Steve, Monica Williams Hudgens is on the phone with us. She is the granddaughter of a former U.S. Senator and uh, infamous segregationist Strom Thurmond. Uh, Monica, you and I have talked a little bit about this, and uh, I want to just sort of explore this publicly here in the couple of minutes that we have left, uh, you feel a sense of, of calling or duty or something to sort of, re- as sort of your reaction to this legacy that has been bequeathed to you. Uh, what, what are you thinking in terms of what you want to do with this? Well, that's very true. I do feel this sense of obligation to um, continue to the healing, definitely a healing, and that's also something that my family has gone through since my mother came forward. Um, A unity. Um, I think our family is more like the modern family now, biracial, biracial. Children are being born by choice, uh, but some people are still from the old school of thought and still aren't very accepting. I just know that um, I think a sense of real godliness has to be taken into account in order to be able to deal uh, with these issues because of the things that were said in the past. I would like it to make it my goal to say, okay, I am the one of the granddaughters of Strom Thurmond. How can I improve things here in South Carolina? How far has South Carolina progressed since his legacy? I know he tried to make many changes um, before he went out of office. And he made amends for many different things, one by hiring the first um, aid into the White House by voting for uh, legalizing uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday uh, as a holiday. There are some things he started doing um, towards the end, and I've also spoken with many African Americans here who like to tell the story of what he did to help them if they lost a job or their home or um, just different issues that they could go to him and talk to him. See, and that's that, that, that different personality. So it wasn't that he just kept it with my mother. And the one thing he did tell her, well, as he made, as times changed, I changed. And he openly admitted that. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to see more of those changes continue to happen because I see some carryover and layover from those days um, since I've been living here in South Carolina. So I'd like to continue in that fashion of um, healing and seeing more unity, um, more acceptance, and more change. Well, that's great. Um, I think that is uh, all that anybody could really ask. You know, uh, you're certainly not obligated to do anything, but I think it's wonderful that you um, are are seeking to do something with this legacy to make South Carolina a better place and um, and to build on the changes that you're. Your grandfather, uh, uh, you know, the changes that he did make. I think that's fantastic. Monica, I want to thank you very much for joining us uh, for We Up Talk today. It was a pleasure to meet you a few weeks ago. Uh, It's been a pleasure to talk to you today, and uh, we wish you well as you move forward. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, there is a collaboration going on to tell more of the story. Um, There was only part of the story told in Mom's book, and she said um, she wanted my sister and I to go ahead and tell the rest. So I'll leave you with that. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, good luck with that, and uh, keep us posted, okay? Thank you. Thank you, and good night. All right, Monica. Take care. 
that was interesting. Yeah, Monica, interesting. Monica Williams Hudgens, the uh, the great, I'm sorry, the granddaughter of Strom Thurmond. 